I want to uh, welcome you all to the first of our season's Institute Encounters, uh, which is a series of interviews we do with the guest speakers that the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization brings to Texas Tech. Uh, and we're really uh, starting off um, with a bang this year uh, because we have someone who can speak to a subject that's hot off the headlines uh, that uh, all those folks out there uh, interested in higher education are closely attending to at the moment. Um, and that is uh, the way in which civil rights law uh, is applied to our colleges and universities through Title IX. But before we get there, I'd like to kind of cover uh, a good deal of more fundamental ground. And we're going to do that with our speaker, who is Professor Gail Harriet. Uh, professor Harriet uh, is a professor of law, uh, specializing, among other things, in civil rights law at the University of San Diego Law School. But she is also a member of the United States Commission on Civil Rights, uh, a position that she has held since 2007, uh, having been appointed to that body uh, by the uh, Senate Republican leader, Senator Mitch McConnell. So welcome uh, to Institute Encounters. Um, I, I think uh, you've been doing the Lord's work, not only on the Civil Rights Commission, but uh, here at the university spoken yesterday to our law students and today to our honor students. But um, uh, and I, I certainly want to get to those topical aspects that, that you addressed in, in, in both of your talks. But, but let's, um, since this is a kind of scholarly enterprise, uh, let's see if we can establish some foundational uh, background for it. Um, the whole term civil rights uh, is much used and I think often abused. Um, it has a core set of meanings, but it's often stretched uh, incredibly to uncover many things that uh, the people who originally formulated the phrase would never imagine could be covered by civil rights. So where does the term civil rights come from in the first place, and uh, what did it initially mean, and how has it evolved? Okay. First, let me say thank you so much for inviting me out here to Texas Tech. Um, you're right. The term civil rights... Uh, has taken a few twists and turns uh, in its history. Uh, the first use of that term um, that I have looked at uh, goes back to the 18th century. Um, and back in those days, they were using the term civil rights uh, to contrast with natural rights. So natural rights were God-given rights, rights that, that should be the same for everybody around the world no matter what government is in charge. Uh, civil rights were rights that were peculiar to a particular polity. So, for example, in England uh, during the, the, the 18th century, um, someone accused of a crime would be entitled to a jury of 12 members. But in Scotland, you get 15 members. So you could say that in Scotland there is a civil right to 15 members, while in, in England there is a civil right to 12 members. Um, and you just wouldn't use a term like natural right there because there could be some other method of dealing with the issue uh, that would be perfectly okay in some other, other culture. Um, during the 19th century, the term ended up getting used far more commonly. It became a, a, a much more popular term, but it meant something completely different. Rather than contrasting with natural rights, civil rights were contrasted with political rights. Um, so someone may live in a particular country and be a citizen but not have the right to vote. Um, but they may have civil rights even though they don't have political rights. So political rights would be the right to vote, the right to stand for election. Uh, but a civil right, uh, to them, a civil right would be a right to participate in civil society. And that meant the right to own property um, and to have the state recognized that you are the owner of that property and not somebody else. Uh, it would include things like the right to contract. So if I promise to do something um, and you promise to do something in return uh, and one of us welches on the deal, um, essentially this would turn out to be the right to sue or be sued. Uh, and I know a lot of people think about the right to be sued and what kind of a right is that? Uh, but in fact it's a very important right. 
uh, because if you can be sued, if you can be held to your promises, um, then people will, are willing to engage in business with you. Uh, no lender is going to want to lend you money unless they know that if you don't pay, they can sue you. So if you can't, if you can't be sued, um, then essentially you can't borrow money. You can't, you know, borrow money to, to buy a house. You can't be a homeowner. You can't be, you know, you can't buy a farm. You can't start a business unless you just happen to be so rich in, in, in the first place that you don't need financing. So the right to be sued is in fact a very precious right, the right to own property. Um, and these, are, these were the rights that a 19th century thinker uh, would have called civil rights. And after the Civil War, after the Emancipation, uh, Congress passed a law. Uh, the first one is called the Civil Rights Act of 1866, but they ended up having to re-promulgate it after the 14th Amendment was ratified, because it wasn't quite clear. Uh, in fact, it probably would have been unconstitutional without the 14th Amendment. Congress probably didn't have the power, but they called it the Civil Rights, of 18, Civil Rights Act of 1866. Um, and what it did is it guaranteed to all citizens, um, regardless of race, the same civil rights uh, as white citizens, um, because civil rights differed from state to state. There were different rules, you know, how old you have to be in order to contract, how do they define insanity, because an insane person does not have the right to contract. They can't be held to their promises. Um, and so, rather than try to define civil rights one by one, they just said that everyone, including the, the, the newly freed slaves, will have the same civil rights. And they listed some of those civil rights um, as white citizens. Um, then, as a result of acts like that, people got used to thinking of civil rights in terms of anti-discrimination. So in the 20th century, we got used to thinking civil rights were the rights not to be discriminated against. When Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which was the first civil rights statute, um, in the post-Reconstruction era, um, it's clear they're talking about anti-discrimination. Um, and as time went on, the civil rights era became very important. Um, that term got to be seen, you know, by people as a very good thing. And so they would use terms like the new civil rights agenda to mean, well, sometimes whatever they wanted, sometimes more narrowly things that would, with, would that would be thought to benefit women, to benefit uh, racial minorities, um, uh, religious minorities and such. So that term has changed a lot um, over the centuries. So I guess the, the prohibition on discrimination as the understanding of what civil rights means, to some extent descends from the notion that the newly freed slaves should have the same rights as white people yes. have. Yes, yes. Uh, but now it's being broadened to reach into all er many areas of conduct that would not have been thought covered sure. by the original legislation. Sure. You know, initially they were thinking in terms of rights granted by the state, rights to own property, rights to contract, rights to, to, to buy property, sell property, give it away, uh, inherit property, all of those things uh, would have been considered civil rights. But what wasn't a civil right uh, was the right to vote. So note that Congress first passed this legislation about civil rights, and it's not till the 15th Amendment, which wasn't ratified, I think it's 1870, 1871, um, yeah. yeah, that's what granted mm -hmm. um, the right to vote, um, or rather prohibited discrimination on the basis of race uh, and voting rights. So in Plessy versus Ferguson, the decision is handed down that when it comes to riding on a, on a railroad car, uh, the state can segregate blacks and whites, uh, and the Supreme Court decides that that's not a violation of equal rights because they're all getting their, each, each is getting their own part of yeah, the Yeah, basically a very yeah. unpopular decision today, right. of course, but with Plessy versus Ferguson, they say separating is okay as long as it's equal, so that's mm -hmm. where you get that term separate but equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and we also hear uh, the, the term civil liberties. Now, is that a re more recent invention, and does it mean something like civil rights? Well, the definition of civil liberties is never quite as clear. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people use that as a sen essentially the equivalent of civil rights. Sometimes they use it in other meanings. Uh, but I tend to shy away from using it. Um, you know, if you want to talk about, about certain things that might be considered, you know, privileges um, in some sense of the word, 
um, then sometimes people use the word civil liberties. Uh, but I shy away from that. When do civil rights become extended to how you're treated by non-government entities? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, my read um, of, of the original Civil Rights Act of 1866 um, is that it only talks about you know, rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. The state has to recognize that you are the owner of the property. Um, they have to treat you as the owner if you, if you are, have purchased that property and such. Um, but interestingly, um, there's another body of common law uh, about the need uh, for hotels um, and, and uh, common carriers uh, to provide for everyone. And that's, that's, they were in a special category. And during Reconstruction, Congress attempted um, to guarantee um, that one would not be discriminated uh, by common carriers as, as, as well. Um, and, you know, for, for, for that came to naught on, on, on some bases. Uh, but there's always been that need, although separate but equal, um, in Plessy versus Ferguson, they thought was, was, was okay. Um, but it wasn't until the 1960s um, two things happened. One, the Civil Rights, of 19, Civil Rights Act of 1964 contains Title VII. And Title VII applies not just uh, to common carriers and, and, and hotels, but to all employers. It, it's it's a, an anti-discrimination act that forbids discrimination by even private employers. So that was, that's a big step, and that was the most controversial part of the act. Uh, but also, a few years later, the Supreme Court, looking back um, at these Reconstruction era statutes, I believe misinterpreted them to forbid private discrimination. Now, in the decision uh, that misinterpreted these acts, it didn't make that much difference because Congress had already passed the Fair Housing Act, uh, and that did prevent um, property owners from discriminating in the sale of a property. Um, but it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm quite confident um, that the Reconstruction era Congress did not intend to cover private people, private entities generally outside of this special category of common carriers um, and hotels and, and, and such. Um, but the Supreme Court made a mistake um, and did in fact apply it. Again, that particular decision didn't make much difference because Congress had indeed extended it with the Fair Housing Act. We now also have enlarged the number of distinctions that can't be made. So the original Civil Rights Act is focused on race. Um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 also included sex. I don't know if that was the first time. That sex was in it's it. It's so interesting what, how that sex got well, in there. Judge Howard Smith, wasn't it? Um, was trying to sink the bill. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> they were trying to. The, the people who opposed the bill entirely knew that some of the supporters would have supported uh, adding sex, and that others would not. And they thought that if they could add it in there, they'd get a majority behind adding it. But then the bill as a whole would not pass. But they turned out to be wrong. Um, it passed anyway, and it also includes it race, color, religion national origin, and sex. Um, were those others also added as an attempt to sink the bill, or did, was it originally simply race? Um, no, I, I, they included color because there, there is some, some dis, you know, some people were making distinctions based mm -hmm. on, on color uh, rather than race, um, and I think that religion and national origin got in much earlier than sex. Sex was really a last minute thing. Um, so it's interesting, in, in the case of all of those things, Except for religion, you're dealing with something that an individual has no control over. Mm -hmm. But in the case of religion, you're dealing with a matter of, of belief and behavior. Mm -hmm. You don't inherit your religion. So was, was, did that represent, at the time it was done, did that represent a distinctive new turn in thinking about the coverage of civil rights? Well, I think they hadn't dealt with it uh, as much in the past. Um, as they had with race, but I'm not sure they gave it a whole lot of thought. I mean, you're pointing out here that the people do indeed control their religion. I mean, you can imagine hypotheticals, you know, they're thinking of we don't want discrimination, for example, discrimination against Jews was very common at the time. Um, and they were thinking about, 
you know, traditional religions. Uh, but, you know, what if you're the employer and I come to you um, and I'm applying for a job um, and just I casually mention that I'm a devil worshiper uh, who believes in eating, eating live rats uh, and that that's my religion, um, that every morning I have to have a live rat uh, that I will then eat. And you think, this woman's cuckoo. Um, are you allowed to, to decide not to hire me? Um, I put it all in terms of religion. Um, and you know, what do you do with a case like that? I mean, my suspicion is these cases, when they occur, which won't be very often, but there are some cuckoo people out there who might claim uh, very odd religions. Uh, I suspect that, that employers smile politely and hire someone else. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, is that appropriate under Title VII? Um, should there have been something to suggest, um, you know, what the limits are? I don't think it would be easy to, to define the limits under those circumstances because there are lots of religions that people might resent and yet are perfectly legitimate, don't show that that person is as incompetent as an employee. Well, in the case of Jews, of course, you could have put ethnicity in there and, and, and that might have covered it. Um, I, I only ask the question because increasingly uh, civil rights protections are extended to people who have not been people who have decided to kind of pursue a certain type of behavior. Um, I'm thinking here of kind of sexual orientation or the discrimination. Um, and uh, I, I've always wondered whether that has received uh, kind of the amount of, of, of thought by the, by the folks who have kind of introduced that into the civil rights mix. Uh, as the other categories are perceived. Of course, they would say that that's not, you know, voluntary activity. Yes, that's just, that's, that's their, their, their wiring. Um, so you get disagreement on right. whether or not that right. is, that is mm -hmm. choice. Um, you know, you could make a distinction between sexual orientation and actual sexual activity. Right. Um, but, you know, then you're, you're, you're getting down to, to, to some distinctions that, that I don't think, you know, would, would be resented by many. Well, um, yes, they, 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 they would be. Um, but traditionally, you know, we always have thought that it's a right of people to be able to make distinctions, be able to make sort of what they consider to be moral distinctions. And of course, we have that case, those kinds of cases arising right now with the bakers and the, and the florists mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who don't want to, for mm -hmm. religious reasons, who don't want to participate uh, in same-sex weddings. Um, it strikes me that once you've crossed the line from things that people can't help to forgetting about predispositions and sexuality to actual forms of behavior where people do behave in a way that somebody might decide was uh, you know morally beyond the pale. Uh, you you could argue that you're infringing the civil rights of 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 of, of other people uh, in preventing them from making those distinctions. You can, but I, I, let me be, let me let me take the other side here. I mean, I was just born to argue. Um, they, you can take the position that they'd already crossed that line uh, with the 64 Act. There were plenty of people whose religion might require them to think of someone else's religion as immoral. Um, and if so, then they feel like they have been forced to hire immoral people because they're being forced to hire someone who's a member of a you know perfectly um, you know well recognized religion, but. It, the employer happens to think that, that, that let's say, Presbyterians are immoral uh, because they don't follow, um, you know, whatever their religion is. Um, so I don't know if you can say that, that we've gone um, from a situation where it doesn't involve moral judgments to one where it does. Well, Sex uh, as well. There could be, there could have been employers who would say it is simply immoral uh, for women to work outside the mm -hmm. home, or it's immoral to put women in 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 a job that, that that puts them in physical danger. I mean, I'm sure you know it takes all kinds. Um, so I don't think there's like one point at which we make a a big leap uh, into immoral. Instead, we we moved into it slowly, um, and that's why these things create so much controversy. Well, it, it, it does seem to me, though, that when religion was added, uh, a, a line was crossed, for better or for worse, but a line was crossed there, uh, and you're no longer kind of dealing with accidents of life that are beyond human control. Uh, you're now telling people what they can do or can't do, 
to other people based on things that other people have chosen to do or not to do. Um, and I think conceptually uh, that's, that's a fairly big deal. Um, and I don't think it's, you know, one could argue the, the pros and cons with respect to different categories. But I, I, I don't think it's been given the kind of uh, attention uh, conceptually that it, that it really deserves uh, to receive. You know, I tend to have a kind of libertarian outlook on things, and I think the ability people to make moral choices and to communicate them is important. It's the way in which society, without the government getting involved, has an opportunity kind of to test uh, what is good, what is bad, what works, what doesn't work, and you allow the, uh, the, the panoply of people all over the all over the country to kind of engage in this process of choice. Um, but it strikes me that when we added religion, we kind of crossed the line and started telling people the sorts of choices that they should make. And I'm not altogether sure that's a good thing. It's going back to your point about why not classify Jews as, as an ethnicity. Uh, they didn't use that word in 1964. They used national origin. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some concern that that might not cover Jews because there was, you know, they no... They came from different places. Yeah, they came from different places. Um, you know, insofar as there's a, a Jewish homeland, it was the, the fairly newly created state of Israel where most American Jews you know, had never even been to Israel. So it would be hard to call, say that their national origin is Israel. Uh, insofar as they had a national origin, it might be Germany or Russia or France or Italy or whatever. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, I think, one of the reasons, because discrimination against Jews was perhaps the most common yeah. religious uh, discrimination at the time, uh, rather certainly the most common religious discrimination at the time. Uh, that's part of the reason there would have been political pressure to include religion. Um, as for LGBT issues, uh, again, this is one of those things where it, there have been several steps, uh, and one of the steps um, was the Price Waterhouse decision of the Supreme Court, um, which has ended up um, arguably providing um, some um, prohibition on discrimination against um, LGBT individuals, uh, even without a new law. And so many people are arguing, well, it's already covered. And they're using that argument both ways. Either it's already covered, therefore we don't need to do it, or it's already covered, therefore what's the big deal? Price Waterhouse uh, did not concern, um, and it was not specifically an LGBT case, but it involved a woman working for an accounting firm, and she had um, intended to be promoted um, to a higher level. And it turned out they refused to promote her because some people thought that she was too pushy, that she had a, an aggressive personality. And her argument was, look, I'm a woman. If I were a man with the exact same personality, they would have promoted me. They'd have loved me. But I'm a woman, and they resent me because I have an aggressive personality. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, if you can prove that, uh, then that's liability under Title VII. And so um, advocates uh, for, for protections for uh, LGBT um, individuals uh, have said, yeah, well, that fits for us. Um, that the objection uh, for, say, uh, a gay male, um, the objection is that he has sexual attraction and sexual relations with another male. Well, if a woman did that, it wouldn't be any problem. Uh, but a man is doing it. And so they've made the argument that it's already covered. Um, and that's, that's, that's coloring the issue somewhat. You serve on the United States Civil Rights Commission, which kind of needs to wrestle with all these thorny and difficult questions and probably never makes anyone happy about uh, the things it decides. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the United States Civil Rights Commission fits in to the history of the evolution of the concept of civil rights. Well, the Civil Rights Commission uh, was established by the Civil Rights Act of 1957. And again, that is, that was the first statute to get through Congress um, since the end of Reconstruction. Um, and mainly what it did is it was, it, 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 it created institutions within the federal government. Uh, it created the Civil Rights Commission and it created the Civil Rights Division uh, at the Department of Justice. Uh, both important building blocks. Um, 
Now, the Civil Rights Commission itself um, has no power. Um, it can't order anyone around. What it does is it investigates issues and reports to Congress and the President, and for that matter to the American people generally if they want to read the report. All our reports are posted on our website. Um, and in those early years, um, the Commission was hugely important in establishing the facts that Congress acted upon when it passed bills um, like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act in 1968. For example, uh, the Commission went to every county in the South and investigated um, who was registered to vote. Back in those days, a lot of people were arguing um, that African Americans um, were just as likely to vote or be registered to vote or be permitted to register to vote as whites if they could pass the literacy test. And that these, they argued that the literacy tests were being, being uh, administered fairly. Uh, but after the commission did its investigation, it was pretty obvious that wasn't true. Uh, there were some counties um, where the vast majority um, of citizens were black, uh, and yet uh, the number of blacks who were, were voting, you know, you could sometimes count on your hands. It would sometimes be like the local minister, where the, the notion that you were going to say that the local minister was illiterate was just absurd. Uh, but yet there were lots of other people who'd gone to school, certainly could have passed a literacy test, fairly administered, but they were not, they were not permitted to do so. Um, and as a result uh, of that very meticulous work, um, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965, which was a very tough act. Uh, and it was politically feasible to make it as tough as it was because they had the data uh, before them. Similarly, the Commission did uh, a lot of research on discrimination in housing, uh, and that made the Fair Housing Act in 1968 um, possible. Um, now that there are a lot of these statutes, um, the statute governing the commission uh, has changed somewhat. During the Reagan administration, there was a new act, um, and that act changed the composition of, of the commission somewhat. We went from six members to eight members, and the way that they were appointed changed somewhat. Um, these days, the original commission, all the appointments were presidential, mm -hmm. but now half of the members, that is, of the eight members. So four of the members uh, are appointed by Congress and four are appointed by the President. And the congressional appointees, um, half are House, half are Senate, half majority, half minority. Um, so each, each House, each party within each House um, gets, gets an, an appointee. Um, and that's different from the original commission. And now we focus more of our attention on making sure that other agencies within the federal government are doing their job in enforcing civil rights um, legislation. Mm -hmm. um, so every year we are required by Congress to have at least one uh, report that focuses on how some agency within the federal government is doing its job with regard to civil rights law. So the supposition now is that as far as the country as a whole is concerned, the scope of civil rights laws are adequate to the problem. It's not more necessarily. Right. <laughs> We're allowed to do other things uh -huh. as well, mm -hmm. and certainly Congress has considered other bills. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they've understood, and I think they're right on this, uh, that is, you know, once you have a certain amount of legislation in place, you need to make sure it's mm -hmm. actually being adequately enforced. So, you know, enforcement becomes as much an issue uh, as legislation. And it's done through hearings and things of that sort. And we fact do. We and do uh, all sorts of fact finding. Mm -hmm. um, this past year. Um, actually, the, the, the report that we have most recently completed was how the EPA is enforcing um, civil rights laws as they mm -hmm. apply um, to environmental protection. And how, what kinds of issues arise with respect to environment? Well, for example, there was some controversy about um, the substance of coal ash, uh, and the EPA um, had taken the position that coal ash was not as, as dangerous um, as some of, of, of the environmental protection advocates have been saying. Um, and so there's a question of whether coal ash um, is disproportionately a problem um, for African Americans. Um, you know, certainly there were arguments that this, these, these coal ash dumps and other kinds of, of, of um, environmental issues, um, that things were being located nearer um, to African Americans. Turns out actually from our research uh, that 
it does not, at least under the measures we were using, um, that coal ash is not being dumped disproportionately close to African Americans. Part of this is because coal uh, comes from certain regions of the country, um, you know, places like West Virginia, um, and West Virginia is not disproportionately black. Uh, to the contrary, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's um, disproportionately white um, relative to, to the country as a whole. Um, and so that was part of what our report was about. Uh, we've also done reports on, you know, how uh, immigration detention facilities are maintained um, and, you know, are immigration authorities doing their job um, in terms of protecting um, civil rights. Uh, we've done lots of these reports um, and some of them get, get more attention than others. Is there generally a consensus on the commission? Um, how does it operate in point of fact? <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> the commission is not a place for people who, who shrink from debate because there are very different opinions uh, on our members and then we try to be collegial um, and um, it's not always as collegial as I'd like it to be but it's reasonably collegial given that there's quite quite serious disagreements um, and you know that makes it interesting. One of the important things um, that the Commission does is whenever we, re we, we release a report, um, any commissioner is, is, is given 30 days then to write a statement and that statement will be part of the report. And frequently those statements are dissents. Um, I have authored, authored quite a few dissents. Um, in fact, I have probably authored more dissents uh, than not dissents. But I think it, it, it's interesting, and it keeps the commission honest. Um, so how would you say, since you're a chronic dissenter, how would you say uh, your take on civil rights differs from that which is the majority of the commission? Well, you know, they would, they would say that I am more conservative. Um, which means? Um, well, I regard myself as a classical liberal. Um, and. Um, my colleagues, many of them, regard themselves as progressives, and you know we have the exact you know disagreements that you would expect: classical liberals slash conservatives versus what in the modern day is called liberal or progressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm further on the the, the the right side of the political spectrum, and they're further well, on. What the are left. what are some examples of recent dissents that you've watched? Well, let's see. We had a report recently um, on religious liberties. Um, and it dealt with the issue that you were talking about just a moment ago. Um, you know, what to do in the case of, say, um, a, a baker um, or someone who, who, you know, has some artistic endeavor, um, maybe someone who designs wedding dresses, uh, and they view themselves as, in part, an artist, um, and they do not believe um, in same-sex marriage, uh, they have religious qualms about it. Um, they, you know, we have there are cases, for example, of bakers who are perfectly happy to sell to anyone who comes through the door. Um, you know, regardless of race, religion, LGBT status, but they don't want to participate um, in a same-sex marriage, um, and they would prefer that such a couple go to a, a different baker. Um, and um, I have some, well, I had one colleague in particular who's no longer on the commission. Um, he wrote a statement about the, you know, this was supposed to be a report on the importance of accommodating religious views uh, where we can. Um, and he wrote a statement that I thought was actually, you know, quite intemperate, saying that, that, that religious liberty uh, is just a, a cover for rank uh, bigotry. Um, and I thought this was unfair. Uh, this was, was, was you know, vastly, um, you know, not being fair to people whose religious beliefs um, caused them not to want to be a participant. Was that part of a report itself? I mean, did, was, did his statement speak for the commission when he made it or just for himself? It was his himself? individual statement, mm -hmm. but he was the chairman. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the report itself was actually more balanced than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and as it got out in the press, um, you know, this, this became a big deal for a few weeks. Quite a few uh, major newspapers covered this.
Um, and sometimes they misstated it as the commission's mm -hmm. report mm -hmm. entirely. But I think most of the parts that I thought were objectionable were in individual commissioner statements, uh, not just the chairman's, but, but, but you know, um, at least one of the others as well. Uh, but of course the commissioner statements are a big part of the, of the report. You know, sometimes they take up more space in the mm -hmm. report mm -hmm. um, than the part of the report that was, that was um, generated by our staff and approved by the commission as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, we get into to some rather serious arguments. Um, also, the transgender issue made it into that report to some degree. Um, and, you know, to some extent, you know, what was involved in the transgender issue in the report is what does the law actually require? Uh, the Department of Education had issued um, what they call, you know, a dear colleague letter, a guidance is often the term that, that's used uh, when other, other parts of the government do this, uh, that told schools that they were required to assign an anatomical male who identifies psychologically as a female, they were required to allow that student to use um, the women's room, the women's shower, uh, the women's locker room, uh, or girls, I mean this is actually, you know, this can be high schools, middle schools, and such, uh, even though that person is anatomically male. Um, and, you know, where does the Department of Education derive that authority? I should add, the Trump administration has since withdrawn that guidance, and I think rightly so. They are supposed to not be creating policy. With a guidance, they're supposed to be interpreting the statute. The statute is Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Uh, I can guarantee you this is not what Congress was thinking of uh, when it passed that statute in 1972. The odds are very good they'd never heard the term transgender. Uh, they might have heard the term transsexual, someone who's actually undergone um, surgery. Christine Jorgensen way Yeah, they might have heard that term by then. Uh, but they were not thinking that they were passing a law that would require schools uh, to, to do anything in particular. Um, all Title IX does is forbid sex discrimination. It has a number of exceptions, and one of those exceptions is that it allows um, the executive branch, that is, in this case, right now, the Department of Education in conjunction with the Department of Justice, to um, issue regulations after notice and comment um, that might go beyond the scope of the statute somewhat, although I think this would be much too far beyond. And back during the Ford administration, uh, just after uh, the statute was passed, they actually did issue a regulation that clarifies that separate restrooms, separate locker rooms, separate showers, separate dormitories are indeed permitted. Um, that it permits separation by sex. What does sex mean in that situation? Well, sex means um, sex. What you know, you would assume that that that, that like Congress your fully understand your chromosomes, your anatomy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean how you psychologically mm -hmm. identify. Um, you know, this I think was a pretty easy case uh, in terms of, of of statutory interpretation. I believe um, that this was an, had indeed become an ideological battle. This is what the Department of Education uh, a few years ago wanted the law to be, not what it was. Um, and part of our report was was discussing that. So we can comment on what these agencies have done. So part of the function of the Civil Rights Commission, and maybe its most important historic function, has been to advise Congress as to what civil rights legislation is necessary. But in, now that there's a lot of civil rights legislation on the books, another important function that it's had to assume is uh, trying to see whether those laws are being administered mm -hmm. according to the language and, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's not just a report to Congress, right. it's a report to the President mm -hmm. because if an executive agency is doing something wrong, very often the President uh, can fix it just by, by saying, don't do that anymore. Um, is that most of what the Commission does nowadays? I wouldn't say that. I, mm -hmm. I would say we, 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 we comment on all sorts of issues um, that, that deal with discrimination. Um, even though they aren't necessarily issues that relate back to a particular uh, agency enforcement. I mean, what, what is true is that we are required to at least make sure that some of our work each year is evaluating agency conduct. What are some of the more important projects that the Civil Rights Commission is dealing with now? Well, let's see. Um, we are about to release a report on the, what we call the fines and fees issues. Um, 
after the riots in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, there has been some discussion of what upset people there was not simply um, the case of a, a, a police officer shooting uh, a member of the public because, you know, after I think all the facts came out, um, it was pretty clear uh, that the police officer did not act wrongfully. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, there's a genuine desire to want to understand what caused Ferguson to go up like a tinderbox like that. You know, was it really just the case involving Mr. Brown? Um, or were there other issues as well. And some people think that one of the problems is that Ferguson as a town finances uh, a rather large part of its budget um, on fines and fees. Um, and so at least it was felt by some people um, that they write too many tickets, uh, too many speeding tickets, too much of this, too many fines, too many fees, and particularly for people who, who can't afford to pay. Um, this ends up being uh, a vicious circle for them. They end up just building up. They don't pay. An extra amount is assessed against them, um, and um, it just spins out of control, and often they end up in jail, even though they're, they, they really the only thing they did um, was that they couldn't afford to pay. Um, and so we are doing a report on that. And that's an issue where at least there's partial consensus um, on the part of, of the commissioners. Um, insofar um, as a, a, a municipality is motivated um, by the desire to, to fill their coffers um, in deciding what level of enforcement um, is appropriate, uh, that's not a great idea. And I think it's... So is the civil rights issue in this case one of methods of raising revenue? And some are accepted it's acceptable in a civil rights sense and others aren't uh, or is it a case of disparate impact well that's an interesting question you know I tended to look at it as we were looking at the question of why Ferguson went up as a tinderbox in which case it's more directly related uh, to race relations um, and I think some of my colleagues think of it as a disparate impact issue but there always is the danger of the Commission going beyond its actual jurisdiction. Um, there's a part of our statute that says that we have jurisdiction over the, administrative, the administration of justice. And it's in a different, it's worded in such a way um, that some people have taken the position that on issues of the administrative of, administration of justice, we have a much greater jurisdiction. Um, and this has never been resolved by a court um, and but the, the, the argument is actually a close question and I, I have tended to stay out of it. Uh, I thought on this one we had the jurisdiction um, even though um, you know, I didn't have to think about the issue of whether our jurisdiction uh, was broader in the administration of justice. But some of my colleagues uh, very firmly believe that it is. Uh, and they may, it may be that a court would ultimately side with them if this ever is litigated and I doubt it ever will be. Um, but, so that's, that's how we're able to deal with that issue. There was also plenty of disagreement, I think. Um, you know, one thing I'm concerned about um, is that, you know, at the same time we have people arguing that we need to de-incarcerate. Um, we have people arguing that fines are also a bad thing. And they're arguing that suspensions from schools are a bad thing. And I'm starting to wonder what kind of punishments for misbehavior, minor misbehavior, are going to be left. Uh, and I felt that the, the, the commission, in talking about the need not to fine people so much, were forgetting, okay, you know, there needs to be ways in which uh, the peace can be kept. Uh, and like, I tend to have a libertarian streak just like yours um, and feel that, you know, there are many laws out there that simply require people to do things that they shouldn't be doing. But I also think that the work of James Q. Wilson and others. Um, in crime fighting, the need to keep basic order, um, the need to make sure that like graffiti is not the worst crime in the world, but it needs to be punished uh, because it gives people a sense of disorder when there's graffiti everywhere, when there's glitter everywhere, and that some cities have had great success in cutting down on crime by focusing uh, not on the big stuff, 
They've always got to focus on that. I mean, obviously, if a murder occurs, if a rape occurs, arson is a very serious crime. You know, you need to, to do everything to, 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 to control that. But the notion of don't sweat the small stuff, that's not really a great idea when it comes to, to, to fighting crime in a city. Sometimes you have to sweat the small stuff. Uh, and that means there have to be, be um, ways in which that can be dealt with. And if you say, well, you can't find people who don't have money, what's the alternative? Um, and I felt the commission needed to focus more on what's the alternative. You know, is it community service? Can, can, can towns like, Sir, like Ferguson pull off that? Um, and so, you know, I disagreed with the commission in its, its, its focusing not, you know, not enough on, on alternatives and too much on this notion of it's unfair to find somebody who can't afford to pay. Um, you know, sure, but what are you going to do instead? So you, you brought up disparate impact, so let's talk a little bit about that as a civil rights concept. Um, disparate, imp disparate impact means that you can test whether a law in its application is discriminatory or not based on outcomes, aggregate outcomes within affected groups. So if there's a difference between different ethnic groups or different, uh, different sexes or whatever, um, uh, you put the burden of proof on, on the policymakers to show why that's justified. Um, immediately you have a kind of suspect uh, policy because of that impact. Now that, that, that strikes me, at least it seems to me, that you can argue that what this has done is taken civil rights and applied it to collectivities, applied it to groups rather than individuals. Um, what's, your, what's your feeling about that? Okay, well that's a very big topic. Um, when Congress passed Title VII, uh, that is the part of the, of the Civil Rights Act that applies to employment discrimination. You know, as, as, a, as a legal scholar, I am utterly confident they were not thinking of disparate impact. They thought they were outlawing intentional discrimination. Um, but, as time went by, and it actually didn't take very much time, um, some people started arguing uh, that Title VII also applies to employee, employer actions um, that have a disparate impact. One of the reasons I am confident that Congress did not mean this is that actually there was like a minor scandal that, that, that happened uh, before the act was passed. In Illinois, their Fair Employment Practices Commission uh, decided a case called My Art, uh, where a guy had, had applied for a job, uh, he was African American, and you had to take um, a really quick test uh, before they would consider you. And so he, he, he went and applied for a job, he took the little test, handed it to, to the person at the desk there, uh, and she said, you know, fine, don't call us, we'll call you. Um, and he was pretty confident that he passed the test and then he didn't get a job. And we'll never know because, you know, they told him that he flunked, but the test itself had been thrown away. Um, and he made a complaint to the Fair Employment Practices Commission and the decision by a very low-level decision maker, this is not a judge, uh, was that, you know, we'll never know whether he passed, but even if he didn't pass, the test is unfair because fewer African Americans pass uh, than whites because they haven't had the same opportunity for education. And that actually caused something of a stir. Uh, and it was reported in a number of, of, of newspapers that, that, that see this is what's going to happen, uh, even something that isn't intended to have an effect upon race. Um, is going to be declared illegal. And a number of members of Congress uh, said, no, that's not what we're doing. Um, so that's one reason um, that you, can, you, you know that that's not, that's not what they meant. By discrimination, they meant uh, whether it's conscious or unconscious that you actually desire the result that African Americans won't, won't get as many jobs or, or, or that women won't, or, or men or whites or whatever. Um, but um, a case arose down in North Carolina, um, Griggs versus the Duke Power Company. Um, and Duke had been a discriminator before um, the, 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 the Title VII had passed. And after it passed and went into effect, um, or let me say, at the same time that it went into effect, they instituted new rules. And among those rules, uh, they required a high school diploma uh, for certain jobs. Um, there were also some other tests that they would give. 
uh, but the high school diploma is a good enough example for us. Um, in the particular county where they were functioning, um, more whites would have had a, a uh, high school diploma um, than blacks. Um, and so this had a disparate impact. Um, and the Supreme Court, when they decided the case, um, took the recommendation of the EEOC, followed their, their, um, their opinion of what the statute meant, and held that if a statute, I mean, if a particular job qualification has a disparate impact, uh, then the employer has to be able to prove not just that this is kind of a good idea, but that they have a business necessity, a pretty high standard. Um, and again, I think that's probably a misinterpretation of the statute, but it's, it's, now, it's now water under the bridge. The problem with it is that everything has a disparate impact on some either racial group, one of the two sexes, some religion, um, some uh, national origin group. I mean, it is a very complex world out there. And you wouldn't know it, but it happens to be true um, that, for example, Cambodian Americans uh, disproportionately have experience in the donut industry. So if you were looking for someone to help you run your donut, um, your donut store, um, that would give a disproportionate leg up to Cambodian Americans. Um, any job that requires strength has a disparate impact on women. A job that requires fine handiwork, knitting, is going to have a disparate impact on men. Um, there's no end to it. You know, if you can name any job qualification that doesn't have a disparate impact on some group, um, Asian Americans are more likely to have advanced degrees in STEM uh, areas. Uh, so that has a disparate impact on non-Asians. Uh, Unitarians are much more likely to have a college degree than Baptists. Um, you know, there is no end to it. Um, and so what the Griggs case does is it makes any job qualification presumptively illegal. Um, and the Supreme Court tried to back away from that in all kinds of ways. And then legislation in 1991, um, you know, backed away from some of those Supreme Court decisions, but created other other obstacles to bringing a disparate impact status lawsuit. But nevertheless, um, we're in a weird situation where if we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit now that everything an employer does in deciding which, which employees to hire or fire or promote uh, will have a disparate impact on some group, sometimes when the employer can't possibly even know it. I mean, imagine an employer who has no idea that, that Cambodian Americans are more likely uh, to have experience in the donut industry and ends up you know, getting a number of applications uh, and hires a disproportionate number of Cambodian Americans. Um, and you know, somebody from a group that, that, that um, you know, isn't included says, hey, that has a disparate impact. Um, the employer doesn't even realize this. Uh, which is just looking for somebody who has experience. Do they have business necessity? Do they absolutely need somebody uh, who has experience in the donut industry? How about somebody who's worked for McDonald's? Um, so what sort of weight has this hung on American, the rationality of American hiring? Well, it means that employers have gone out of their way to be very secretive uh, mm. about what the job qualifications for any particular job would be. It used to be very common to say we require X, Y, and Z, and some employers will still do it, but lawyers will tell them, don't do that, don't do that. And so people end up applying for jobs that they actually have no chance of getting. You send out a hundred resumes uh, and you get one job offer. In an earlier time, if you understood what skills were needed, you would know which ones you were likely to get and which ones you weren't likely to get. Uh, I've talked to a number of students who, who I think are quite naive, believing they can get some jobs that they're obviously not going to get. And, you know, they, 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 they put their heart into this. And the employer doesn't want to specify what the actual job qualifications are. But that doesn't mean they're not using those qualifications when they're actually looking through those resumes. Um, it also means, you know, that we're in a position now uh, to where the EEOC basically is a law unto itself. Um, they, they don't actually have rulemaking, um, substantive rulemaking authority uh, under Title VII. Congress was very careful and very purposely tried to make the EEOC a very weak agency. Their job was going to be to mediate uh, between employer um, and employee or prospective employee. Uh, 
Congress wanted to make sure that the federal courts were going to be the ones that were going to, going to flesh out the meaning of Title VII, because every law, as important as that, is going to require some decisions about gray areas. They didn't want the EEOC to have that power, but the EEOC started issuing guidances, um, and that is, in theory, non-binding, but if you're, if you're an employer, unless it's really high stakes for you, you would be rock stupid not to do what, what, the, what the EEOC says. So they've become a very, very powerful agency based on powers that were supposed to be not very powerful. And they can pick and choose which disparate impacts impress them. Um, so, for example, one thing that they've done um, is they've basically wiped out um, the use of, of, of um, paper and pencil tests. Um, in order to, to decide whom to hire, unless those paper and pencil tests are very, very carefully developed just for that employer, uh, it requires huge investments of, of, of money. I remember back when I was, was, was um, applying for a job, when I was much younger and before uh, all of this had, had, had become part of the legal fabric, I remember being given like a math test when I applied for a job. Um, at a department store to be a clerk when I was in school. Um, and they were able to use that test. I'm not sure they'd be able to use a test like that today. Um, although, to be fair, we now have cash registers that don't require any math ability. You know, they make the change for you, but in those days you, you had to be at least... You know, can, you, can you use degrees attained? That's well, that's, that's, yeah, you sure can. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not clear why that would be so. The EEOC hasn't gone after that. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I've heard some people say that it's like a, it's an ideological issue. Um, that, that, you know, they, they like colleges and universities. Um, <laughs> and, you know, that's, they're, they're more politically aligned with colleges and universities, so they're mm -hmm. not going to come down on, on that. Uh, but in theory, at least, you know, you could tell an employer, you know, why are you using this? Why use college degree? Um, you know, it certainly has a disparate impact on subgroups. You know, Unitarians uh, have extremely high uh, college degree rates. You know, other religions, some of them have extremely low um, college degree so, rates. So despite the cost and, and arguably the irrationality of, of preventing employers from, from looking at relevant job qualifications, uh, I take it not many challenge this, not many people right. of political consequence right. challenge right. this. And, and the reason is the magic word civil rights? Well, I think what happens is it's very hard for an employer to challenge it. Um, it's hard for them to have, I'm you know... I'm thinking more of political leadership here. Oh, the, that you're right on the civil right. rights, you know, mm -hmm. the, the idea of, of, of doing much with this. In 1990, 1990s, um, when President George H.W. Bush was president, early 90s, um, their Congress um, was coming close to, to passing um, a civil rights bill, um, and Bush said, I'm not going to sign it, it's a quota bill. Uh, and I think he was right not to sign it. Um, but the political pushback was strong, and he ended up negotiating with Congress, um, and they got a better bill uh, than would otherwise have come, um, come his way. But it was still a very, very flawed bill. Um, but the, the political pressure to sign it was so great um, that he did. Uh, and I think that bill, for very complicated reasons, um, reasons that I think President Bush himself would have had a hard time understanding because he's not a lawyer, um, but, you know, that, that bill has caused some problems. You know, there were some improvements in it, but, you know, I think on the whole it netted out as a, as a bad bill. Uh, but he signed it. Um, and it actually increased the likelihood that one would get um, more disparate impact lawsuits. Uh, but it also pushed back on disparate impact in some ways. So it was a complicated bill. Um, but in general, I think um, that, you know, it's the third rail um, in politics. Uh, legislators, members of Congress, really don't want to pass legislation um, dealing with that. Employers have a hard time bringing in action against an EEOC guidance because a court will say that's not a final agency action. You can't challenge that. So if they ignore it and they get sued, then the case can be brought before a court. Uh, but it's not so easy to bring the case. Uh, and most, most employers are going to knuckle under because, you know, rather than risk that the court will end up agreeing with the EEOC, 
they're better off just doing what the EEOC says. Um, it's not so easy to bring a private lawsuit uh, on a disparate impact theory because it requires a lot of proof. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires, um, you know, it requires a lot. But the EEOC is able to basically pick and choose which disparate impacts uh, bother them. Um, and that has more of an effect. Although there are disparate impact lawsuits that are brought privately as well. Um, no, it's a commission as well. And, and who appoints its members? How do the members of the EEOC get picked and, and confirmed? Um, they are um, nominated. Uh, they are required to be bipartisan, so there's more, there's more um, contact between uh, the Senate and the President uh, on that than there is on mm -hmm. some of these because it's required to be bipartisan. But they, they are confirmed by the Senate as well, and they have terms. Um, President Trump has nominated someone. I can't remember the, the, the name of the guy that he's nominated, but we have, you know, there, there's a nominee at this point for, for one of the vacancies. There may be another vacancy. Uh, but the EEOC uh, is a much larger agency than the Civil Rights Commission. We have a small staff. They have a huge staff uh, because in order to bring uh, a lawsuit under Title VII, you first have to file a complaint with the EEOC and they have to have their chance to try to resolve it. Mm -hmm. um, they also have expanded jurisdiction. It's not just Title VII. You know, they deal with some of the other statutes, other anti-discrimination statutes. Um, they deal with some of the federal um, federal anti-discrimination within federal employ employment. So a government employee who believes that he or she's been discriminated against is going to have some dealings um, with the EEOC as well. So it's a very large agency, uh, whereas we're just a little tiny one. Um, and our commissioners are part-time, and I think that was very purposeful uh, on the part of Congress, given that we were going to be looking at how the federal bureaucracy is administering um, civil rights law. They wanted to make sure that they had people who, you know, don't owe anything to the federal bureaucracy. I get paid for being a, a civil rights commissioner, but mainly I'm a law professor at the University of San Diego. Um, and so if, you know, if push comes to shove, you know, I, I feel perfectly confident um, in giving my opinion, and I don't feel like I have to beg um, from anybody. Um, and I think that's a good idea for civil rights commissioners. They should be outsiders. Um, and that's what I am. I'm an outsider. Uh, presumably, the, you know, the initial idea of civil rights was to have laws that treated everybody equally, erased distinctions. Everybody was a citizen. Uh, but from what you've told me about the evolution of civil rights law, uh, you could as well argue that putting these things on the statute books have, over a long, the long haul, multiplied distinctions. Uh, created new categories that are special rights holders as opposed to others. Um, I understand that uh, there's an issue now affecting the state of Hawaii uh, that would in some sense create a whole new tribal group and that the Civil Rights Commission has taken an interest in that. Maybe you could explain well, that. a few years back, this is a report from like six years ago or so, um, maybe more than six years ago now. Uh, but when I first um, got on the commission, um, there's a, a long-standing issue here that's very complicated with Hawaii. As you will recall, Hawaii was originally a kingdom. Um, and it was established in the early 19th century. Before that, the Hawaiian Islands was a, a group of, of warring tribes. But Kamehameha united them into one kingdom. And the Kingdom of Hawaii was a very multiracial uh, thing. It was not just what we think of as, as, as Native Hawaiians or ethnic Hawaiians. I don't much like that term Native Hawaiian because if you're born in, in Hawaii, you're a Native Hawaiian. Uh, but it if gets you're used born in America, you're a Native American. Uh, absolutely. That, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, but at any rate, the Kingdom of Hawaii was very multiracial. Um, and at some point, um, the, the, the queen, the last queen, Lilia Wakalani, was overthrown and the Republic of, of Hawaii was established. Later, Hawaii was annexed um, into the United States, and later still, Hawaii became a state. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, is that um, the kingdom was multiracial. It had Portuguese, 
It had uh, Americans, it had Brits, it had Chinese, it had Japanese. There were lots of different people, in part because uh, contact with Westerners caused disease in Hawaii. The, the uh, population re reduced, and the various kings and queens of Hawaii were very keen on immigration. They wanted lots of people to come. Um, and so the Kingdom of Hawaii was not an Indian tribe. It was not uh, you know, a particular group. It was a multiracial group, very complex, and very, you know, th th this was not a, a, a a you know band of, of of you know a small group. It was a very complex society, um, and the monarchy had certain lands, and those lands um, were then became owned by the Republic of Hawaii. Then they were ceded to the federal government when Hawaii became a territory. Then they were ceded back to the state of Hawaii um, when Hawaii became a state. They're called the ceded lands today, uh, and the Hawaiian Constitution of 1976. Uh, established that the income, or a large part of the income from, from those lands, uh, and the lands are like 20% of, of Hawaii, it's a lot, uh, the income from that has to be used for the benefit of, of ethnic Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians. Um, and they established the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, um, which had a board of trustees, and it was elected only by ethnic Hawaiians. Um, and that Office of Hawaiian Affairs gives benefits that were only available um, to ethnic Native Hawaiians. That is, you know, home loans, business loans, um, a lot of special, a lot of special deals that were for a particular uh, ethnic group. Um, and the Supreme Court decided in a case called Rice v. Cayetano that it was a violation of the 15th Amendment to allow only ethnic Hawaiians to vote. And that started people thinking, oh my goodness, uh, if that's true, what about all these benefits that the, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs gives out? Are they unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment? Um, so someone who was interested in maintaining those benefits got the bright idea of what if ethnic Hawaiians were an Indian tribe? Because if you're an Indian tribe, um, then that's, that's a different set of laws. Um, that discrimination in favor of tribal members by the federal government and perhaps by the state governments as well. Uh, under a case called Morton versus Moncari, that's permissible. Um, what that case was about, the Department of Interior um, having special hiring preferences uh, for members of certain tribes that the Department of Interior had to deal with. Uh, so they wanted to have, have people that knew those tribes well and were members and it, it, would, it would, you know, they thought be good policy. And the Supreme Court said that's permissible because you're discriminating on the basis of membership in a sovereign entity or a semi-sovereign entity. And so um, those who were backing the special benefits for ethnic Hawaiians um, thought that, well, if we can transform this group into an, a tribe, um, then um, it will be okay. Uh, and thus was born um, a, a bill in Congress that was informally called the Akaka Bill. Um, and the Civil Rights Commission um, did a, 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 a special report on the Akaka Bill, coming very firmly down against it um, as a matter of, of constitutional law. Um, I do not believe um, that one can create a tribe that doesn't already exist. What the federal government can do is recognize a tribe. Uh, the idea here is this is a, a political entity that exists, and we are simply dealing with reality. This exists. Uh, we make a treaty with them, um, and you know they 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 pre-existed, uh, and they continue to exist. And they're not just a group of people; they have a governance. Of they have they have they have some sort of political structure. Sometimes, for some of these very tiny structures, the tiny tribes, uh, the structures are very informal, but they exist. Whereas in Hawaii, um, there was no such structure in place at the time that this bill was proposed. And in fact, there really hadn't been, maybe even ever, um, since the Hawaiian Islands were warring tribes, lots of different political entities. Kamehameha united them. But even you know, in his time, um, he was very keen uh, on inviting foreigners and giving them full rights um, during the you know, evolution of the Kingdom of Hawaii, there were lots and lots of people from many different parts of the world. They, you know, they were given various sets of rights. The Hawaiian uh, Constitution actually talked about 
equal rights and no discrimination on the basis of race um, before our Constitution did. Um, and so to, to view the Kingdom of Hawaii as simply uh, a political structure uh, there in place for, for ethnic Hawaiians is wrong. Also not true of the Republic of Hawaii. And it, over time, you know, as more immigration occurred, it became less and less true. Um, and there's certainly no political entity that was, was pre-existing. Um, so I don't believe that you can operate upon a race to create uh, a tribal entity. Um, and so the commission, the commission came out against that. And that influenced um, that influenced things. Um, this was during, so it had to be more than 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 than. Uh, it's more like ten years ago. This is when President George W. Bush uh, was president, uh, and he came out strongly against the bill, and the bill didn't make it. Now, during the Obama administration, they revived the idea uh, and have attempted to do it not through Congress, but through the action of the Department of the Interior to set up a way in which, um, a framework under which ethnic Hawaiians can come together and form a tribe. Again, I don't, I don't think it's legal, uh, and it, you know, it's not been finished, um, and I don't know what the status of it is right now. Would this um, open the door to other ethnic groups well, coming you know, together and forming tribes? Well, funny you should right? say that. If you can create a, a political entity that didn't exist before out of ethnic Hawaiians, uh, then why wouldn't Congress have the ability to do that uh, out of any kind of group, including religious groups, and I think religious groups would be the ones that would probably want this first. Orthodox Jews, um, you know, there have been Supreme Court and other decisions about the ability uh, of, of political um, entities, municipalities, um, to do things um, that um, turn out not to be permissible for, for a municipality, but might be for a tribe. Um, and so if Orthodox Jews came together and formed a tribe, they may have more powers than they would otherwise have. Bear in mind that tribes are not governed by the Bill of Rights. Um, they are governed uh, ordinarily by a statute, the Indian Civil Rights Act, but it is, does not require as much as the Bill of Rights. Uh, and this is why, back, you know, back to Hawaii, a lot of ethnic Hawaiians are not keen on this idea uh, because they realize this is another entity that will have the ability to tax them. Uh, that will have the ability to make make laws uh, that may not even would would not have been constitutional for the state of Hawaii uh, to make might infringe on their rights in ways that a state could not, uh, and so not everybody's keen on this idea. Uh, but nobody will be forced uh, to join the tribe if they don't want to, um, if it comes about. Well, do, but, do people who think of themselves as progressives see the danger in this issue? I wish they did. I wish they saw it. Uh, more I mean, than the white nationalists might come along and say, well, we're a tribe, too, or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I wish people took this more seriously. I think a lot of members of Congress just saw it as Hawaii's really far away. Uh, and like the members of, 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 of the Hawaii delegation, they seem to be in favor of this, so let's have them whatever, you know, let them have whatever they want. They aren't thinking, like, this would be by far the largest tribe um, that exists in the United States, and if everyone joined it, uh, who would be eligible? Uh, now, I don't know that everybody would, uh, but even if only half of them joined it, that would still be the largest. Well, by, by divorcing the notion of tribe from historical circumstance and making it into something that can establish new creations, I mean, you're, 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 you're taking a, a step that is just laden with potential consequences. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, if, if we we want to look at this thing, I, th I think we want to look at this thing um, as the federal government recognizes groups that have never been completely brought into the mainstream uh, of American culture, that have this separate, long-standing, continuous uh, political entity, and they're just recognizing reality. Once we get into to the possibility of recognizing I mean, not recognizing, but actually creating, making it possible for groups to come together and create, for the first time, a political entity. I think we are entering a swamp that we don't want to be in. So I suppose we can confidently expect the Civil Rights Commission to come forward and unanimously condemn the idea. I, we have a very different <laughs> commission today from what we had when we issued that report. Um, Back when, when you know that that was a group where there were, were more Republican appointees mm -hmm. uh, because some of those were Bush appointees. Uh, right now, um, I think that six out of the eight members 
were appointed by democratic authorities and they consider themselves to be progressives. And they would support um, the notion, do you, you suspect? Well, I don't want to speak for any of them, okay. you just never know. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I do know that my, my colleague Peter Kersnow, mm -hmm. um, um is against the idea. Uh -huh. um, and so, and but, the issue is still alive. Um, well, because of the Department of yeah. Interior, mm -hmm. this still this still may come mm -hmm. to pass in mm -hmm. some way, and it may be legally challenged. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the bill in Congress um, is no longer is no longer what's driving this. It's now executive authority. Well, I, that's a really a kind of very interesting insight to some of the fundamental decisions that not only the Commission but the whole country is facing about the nature of being of the, the nature of being an American and, and what, our, what our country fundamentally is. Uh, you're right at the heart of those decisions, so uh, we, we wish you well, and thank you very much for uh, coming and spending an hour with us. Well, thank you so much for having me.